right. I think we'll go ahead and get started. What do you think, Harry? I think it sounds good. All right. Well, welcome everybody again uh, to VMFA Fridays After Five, a taste of art presented by Chase. My name is Celeste Feta. I'm Director of Education here at the museum, and I'm delighted to welcome Harry Tation from Free Run Wine Merchants. Um, Harry and I are going to have a very casual conversation about some wine um, and some art, and we're just really pleased that you all have decided to spend this half hour with us learning a little bit more about a few Italian wines and some works of art uh, from the collection. Um, so before we, we get started, I did, um, let's see, pull together just a, co a couple of tips for today. Um, and full disclosure, this is our first Taste of Art webinar. So uh, both Harry and I are just uh, welcoming uh, this opportunity to try this out with you all. So just keep that in mind and um, have patience as we navigate anything that may come up um, in this new format for both of us. Yeah, thanks, so, for being, um, thanks for being part of our first one. Yes. <laughs> so if you are pairing wine with us uh, this evening, you go ahead and open your bottle. I just don't want you to, to give you some time to do that if you haven't already. Um, also in this webinar, just as a reminder, you can see us, but we cannot see you. So just keep that in mind. Um, um, that's actually a benefit for, for you all probably. Um, and we are gonna be, because this is a conversation and um, you know, tasting wine is about talking about it and, and sharing impressions, the same with art. We are going to be asking for your impressions, and if you feel good about sharing those, we ask that you use the chat feature. So that chat box is usually at, in your toolbar for Zoom, probably at the bottom of your screen. Just click that, um, and you can select to chat with all of panelists or all panelists and attendees from that drop-down menu. And I just show you an image of what that may look like in a chat box. So if you're comfortable doing that, doing that, please, please do that. Oh, thank you. I just got a compliment on my earrings. Thank you. Um, so also to streamline things, um, we're going to use the chat box for questions. Usually we use the Q&A, but because we're using chat, let's just all keep it there. And if you have a question, please pop that in there. And both Harry and I will do our best to answer that question live as we see it. If we miss something, a question, um, Apologies in advance. Again, we'll do our best to get to those. So if that feels comfortable for everybody in terms of tips, um, we'll kind of we'll go ahead and get started. So Harry, before um, we jump into the to the first class, um, just to share a little bit about about you. Um, you've been in the wine business for decades now uh, yeah. in the area and have worked on the retail side and wholesale side. But tell us a little bit about what you do with free uh, free run wines. So Free Run, we're a distributor based here in Richmond, Virginia. Um, we're privately owned. We're located over by the SVCA on Road Miller. And we sell wine to independent restaurants and wine shops in Maryland, Virginia, and DC. Um, we're not in any big grocery stores or uh, chain restaurants or anything, but we're in most of the best restaurants around uh, those three areas and um, have a really great portfolio of producers, a very well thought out and good uh, list of producers there. Most everyone we represent is family owned, they're estate bottled. Almost everyone is sustainable or organic. Um, and uh, we like what we do. We have a great book and deal with a lot of great customers. I've dealt with the Virginia Museum for years. I know Celeste and I actually did something called the Art of Wine, I believe it was called, uh, maybe, uh, yep. back before the redo, yep. uh, before the Picasso, uh, the big redo and that rollout. And um, they were so much fun. And this is kind of the newest version of that. And yeah. when things get back to maybe being a little more where we can get together, we will possibly start those up again in the museum setting, which is always very fun. So, yes. so I'm excited. And I want to thank Celeste and the museum for including me in the first one of the virtual ones. Um, I'm excited. Um, I was telling Celeste, I've had lots of like Zoom and Google uh, meetings, but I've never had a webinar where I don't see people on the screen. So um, that's kind of a Kind of kind of different and kind of fun so yeah i can't see the faces you're making at me so that works out ah, great <laughs> you can see mine though yes <laughs> yeah. all right so let's um maybe jump into the first uh selection that you have for us harry so i'm gonna um click uh, click to the next slide um and to get us situated where, where this wine comes from so tell us a little bit about that sure. so this uh the first one we're gonna have today is going to be from the uh, veneto so the veneto is up in the northeast part of italy on Celeste's map, there you can see on the right side of the screen is kind of the 
Veneto is at the lower point there. Um, but the Veneto is in the northeast part of Italy. It's an area that's mainly known, I think, probably as we all know, for Pinot Grigio. Pinot Grigio is the king white varietal in that part of, uh, in that part of Italy. Um, it's a part of Italy, it's interesting, because you're in the northeast part of Italy where you're almost more close to Germanic countries, and you end up having like blonde-haired, blue-eyed winemakers from this region that you don't really think of as being Italian. Uh, but I think that's, that's fascinating. We have many producers in that area that kind of look like Nick Nolte, which I think is pretty, uh, pretty fun. Um, so the first producer we're doing is Lafrage Winery. She is in the Veneto. Um, her name is Matilda Poggi. Matilda Poggi uh, took over her family winery in 1984. 1984 was the first vintage that she produced wines. Um, since then, she's converted all of her estate vineyards to being organic. And then in 2009 was able to become certified organic. And that's an interesting thing to think about, 84 to 2009. When a winery wants to become organic, it's a pretty big undertaking. They usually have to let the vines die, let the ground go fallow, and then kind of start over. And that's a huge cost, in, uh, cost investment for a lot of, uh, a lot of small family-owned producers. Um, so she did this over the course of years, and in 2009 became certified. She makes six different wines from her vineyards. Today we're going to try uh, one of her white wines called Garganaga, Garganega. Sorry, Garganega. Garganega was probably the um, most popular white varietal planted in the Veneto uh, before the popularity and craze of Pinot Grigio. Um, I know we have a picture here. Um, so actually, we go back to Matilda. So this is a picture of Matilda Poggi. Matilda Poggi is the owner and the winemaker. Started her first vintage in 1984. She's kind of a rock star in the wine world. Um, last year, she was on the cover of Wine Spectator with, I think, three other producers as being the top female women winemakers in the world, which I, I think is a, a great uh, accolade for, for her. Um, she owns her own land. Everything is a state bottled. Everything has been certified organic. Um, she produces six different bottlings, um, one rosé, one white, and four reds. Uh, we're going to try her white wine today, the uh, Garganega. Um, so, uh, Garganega is the grape, is a, um, the picture there, okay, uh, it's a beautiful cluster of grapes, they're long, it's a tight cluster of grapes, uh, you can see the background there of the hills of the Veneto area, um, the hills of the Veneto area are interesting in that you can see they're kind of low and they're kind of, a uh, more smooth and rolling, they're definitely not, um, mountainous looking, I guess, uh, I'm trying to get to another thing right here, um, yeah, and her, where she grows her grapes is actually from a, they're 16 year old vines and they're from a village called Camparano. So the name of this wine is called Camparano uh, Garganica. Uh, and that's actually in the commune of uh, Cavion Veronese, which is actually very close to Lake Garda. She's only a couple miles from Lake Garda. So she's, she does get an influence from the lake. Uh, the soils in this part of, uh, the, uh, of the Veneto are called a moranic soil, which is a glacially formed soil, which is really just soil and rocks. Uh, but it makes for smooth rolling hills like there are in the picture. Um, elevation where she is is about 600 feet above sea level, which is not, 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 very, not very high. Um, when Matilda harvests her grapes, she hand harvests everything, she whole cluster presses them. So when you whole cluster press a wine, you're just cutting the, the cluster of grapes and you're putting it in the press. So you're pressing the seeds, the skins, the stems, everything. But that adds some complexities and components into wines. It's not something you see done on white wines very often. You do see whole cluster fermentation on red wines fairly often, mainly Pinot Noir, but not so much on white wines. And I think it's kind of unusual. But I think the reason she does that is because she wants to add some components to the flavors of her wine that are just a little more exciting, a little more um, enjoyable. So some of the components you get from whole cluster can sometimes be a woodiness or a stemminess. You can sometimes get a green vegetal note. And I know these are not always the best wine terms, but when they're a component of the rest of the wine, it can add a nice uh, facet to the wine that complements each other. And I think that's what she's done with this wine. So she hand harvests the wine, whole cluster presses, ferments it in stainless steel barrels until spring. And while it's fermenting in stainless steel, it's also with it fermenting in what they call on the lees. The lees are the yeast cells that are left over after fermentation in the bottom of the tank. Um, and there's a process that fascinates me called batonage that most winemakers do that do lees contact for their wines. And what they do is they take like a canoe paddle and they'll go into the tank and they'll stir it once a day, twice a day, once every other day, knowing that every time they stir that wine and get those yeast cells kind of worked up into the, into the mixture of the wine, you're going to end up with more texture and more mouthfeel in your wine. 
Um, so if you have like a really clean, crisp, high acid wine, it probably doesn't have a lot of lees contact. But if you have a wine that's got a little texture, a little mouthfeel, lees contact is usually one of the things that probably uh, has brought that on in the wine. Um, part of that makes me think of just a little, little side note about just winemakers in general. I always think of winemakers as being artists, which is perfect to tie in with what we're doing here today. Because I think a winemaker will take different lots of grapes that they have crushed and, and pressed and they'll, have, they'll store it in stainless steel, a third of it in stainless steel, a third of it in a brand new oak barrel, and a third of it in a barrel that's been used two or three times, so a neutral barrel or a used oak barrel. And then they take those components to make their final product that they want to put their name on, like they want to sign a painting. They want to put their name on it once it's what they want and they're proud of. So I think that's a very interesting uh, correlation between a, an artist and a winemaker because they're just creating something that they're proud of with the components they have. So I think that's, that's, that's always been pretty fascinating. I was talking about uh, barrels and used barrels and new barrels. Another thing that's become really popular and you see it a lot in, uh, in Italy especially is concrete vats. Um, these cement vats have an enamel glass lining and they were actually really popular long time ago before stainless steel barrels became, became kind of in vogue. But what's really interesting is all the producers in Italy who still have those concrete vats with the glass lining and now they're in vogue for having these new vessels. And so if you ever now go visit a Virginia winery, a California winery or a European winery, you will see these new things now called concrete eggs. And they're taller than, than people, they're very wide, but it's a egg shaped vessel that has a glass lining and so many wineries are now buying those and uses those as a vessel to ferment and age their wines. And there's something about the curvature that wine likes. You're not picking up any oakiness or any characters like that. And it was something that was used before stainless steel. So it's, uh, it's become very, very popular. And if you do visit any wineries, they're fun to seek out because they're fun to see. And if you get the winemakers talking about them, they will talk about them because they're, uh, they're kind of new and exciting uh, for, for winemakers or for newer winemakers. So um, I don't know how many people have the wine we're tasting tonight, uh, Matilda's uh, Camperreno uh, Garganega, but uh, hopefully you have some type of white wine in front of you that you can try. Uh, but I will tell you a little bit about uh, her wine here. So Lafrage from the Veneto. Uh, Caparreno is the village, that uh, the commune that she's in. Uh, and uh, Garganega is the grape. Another thing I'll tell you about her labels. All of her labels, she has this uh, color scheme that kind of, to me, looks like a wallpaper print. But what she does is on her red wines, like her Bartolino and wines that she makes, it'll be different hues, different colors. And I think in her mind, that is a sign that in her wine, you're gonna come across flavors and aromas that are gonna make you think of yellow and green. And I think it's a really kind of artistic way to come across what she's putting in her bottle. Uh, so, um, because she does do the extended Lee's contact on the wines and batonage, uh, I do believe that this would be more of a um, medium bodied style wine. It should have good acidity to it. The color to me is kind of light golden, almost kind of straw colored. Um, I think that you get you get kind of aromas of like, like apple, peach, pear. I'd call it more of a medium bodied wine. It's definitely not rich and full and mouth filling like a California Chardonnay you might have had. But I think this makes it a much more enjoyable wine and perfect with foods. This I think would be fantastic with shellfish or um, um, uh, saltfish. You know, saltwater uh, fish or uh, vegetables, I think it'd be perfect with something like that. Hey, so, um, and yeah. as, Harry, um, as people are trying it, if they do want to kind of in yeah. the chat box talk about any tastes or, or flavors that are coming or aromas that are coming. I think it'd be great. Uh, to mine would be great. I also have, um, just to read a question from the chat, Harry, um, someone has asked that they have a friend who is sensitive to sulfites. Are there some Italian wines that we can get that are sulfite free? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a great question because uh, in my career, uh, I have heard so many times when people would say, oh my gosh, my husband and I, my wife and I just went to Italy and we drank wine the whole time we were there and we never had the headaches and we never got things. And people say it's because they don't have sulfites. Well, actually they do have sulfites. Sulfites are a byproduct of fermentation. There are going to be sulfites in any wine. Um, and almost any producer will add a little bit of sulfur when they're bottling um, just as a preservative. Um, I like to think of this this way. Um, you know, at the top of a wine bottle, there's going to be a little bit of space between the wine and the cork. Well, that can, if that's oxygen, that is going to start 
deteriorating the wine. I like to think of wine as like a banana or an apple. Once the skin's removed, it starts to turn brown. And that's pretty much what happens with wine. Once you pull the cork and oxygen gets to it, it starts to, to oxidize. So by there being a little bit of air, a lot of winemakers will put a little blast of sulfur, which is a protectant for them, and, uh, and will work for, for that. But as for sulfites, I do think that, um, uh, it's so weird. I remember doing a tasting, it was at the museum, one of the art of wine things, and there were two doctors in the audience. And I remember making a comment, because people would say, oh my God, I can't drink wine because of the sulfites. And I'd be like, you know, I'm not so sure that it's the sulfites as much as it might be the histamines that are coming out of the seeds and the stems and the barrels, mm -hmm. the oak barrels, because I mean, how many people take Claritin or Zyrtec or something nowadays? I think that people are sensitive to allergies. And I think that those histamines are what make people's skin get flush, their throat might get a little tight or a little flush. I think it's more from histamines, more so than sulfites. I'm not a doctor, so I don't know that for sure, but I've just always kind of thought that makes more sense to me than sulfites, because sulfites are in sliced bread. Sulfites are in so many products that we already eat. But because this is a federally reg regulated project, it has to, a product that has to say sulfites on the label. So when people do have an issue from drinking wine, I think that it is more of an issue with uh, um, histamines and things more so than sulfites. Not that there aren't people that have serious issues with sulfites. Um, I do know there was a wine years ago made in Oregon called uh, Eco Wine, and it was a wine that somehow the winemaker, Myron Redford, uh, was able to make wine that had no sulfites in it, although sulfites are a byproduct of fermentation. Don't know that process, I've never seen it again. I'll admit it was, it was not a very exciting Pinot Noir. It seemed mm -hmm. a little on the, the it lacked uh, some things to me, uh, but um, I do hope that uh, the guest here, I hope that helps a little bit with the answer. <laughs> um, okay, couldn't find this uh, wine, but I have a uh, Falangina. Falangina is a different varietal from a different part of Italy. It's, uh, this is down in the southern central part of Italy where, where Falangina comes from. Um, this could be a different varietal, uh, but it is a white varietal that we are not that familiar with. Uh, I do know that uh, my wife likes to say all the time, you're bringing home wines with varietals I've never heard of. And I think that's so true because there are so many wines made in Italy. Actually, Celeste, can you go back to the map of Italy? Sure. Hold on a I always think this is fascinating because I represent wines from all over the world but um, every single piece of land in Italy has an appellation that designates it able to make wines in that region. And it's the only country I know of in the world that's like that. Uh, Italy makes wine in every available corner. Whereas if you see France, it's Bordeaux and in the Rhone Valley and, and Alsace and, and the Loire Valley. And those are all very small pieces of the country of France. And same thing with, uh, with Spain. Rioja in different areas. But in Italy, it's the whole country, which I think is just, it's fascinating. It's amazing. And lets you know how much wine is a part of their culture. So mm -hmm. point being is Falangina from down the south will be a wonderful wine to have today and to try and enjoy with us. Um, it, it, it's going to be different, I think, than the, uh, uh, than the, uh, the Garganega. Um, but um, I hope that you're going to enjoy it. I love, I like Falanginas. There's another wine from that region called Greco de Tufo to try sometime also if you're looking for wines from that area. Yeah. So I want to also be mindful of time. It's already yeah, no, I'm rambling gone by off. fast. Um, so yeah. I do want to, um, we, you know, in, in thinking about pairing this grape with, um, with a work of art or this wine, yeah. um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, this piece by John Singer Sargent called Venetian Tavern or Venetian Wine Shop. Um, from 1902. This is in our American collection as part of the McLaughlin collection on view now. Um, and, you know, Harry, you were telling me about kind of the, the connection, the possible connection between the grape we just were talking about in this piece. And this scene here. I think that so this is definitely, obviously, it's a, a painting from long ago. The scene is from long ago. Um, painted in 1902, but probably a scene from before then. Um, and most likely, if they're drinking white wine, it looks like they have grapes hanging kind of in the rafters up above the uh, where they're sitting. Um, most likely, it was probably uh, Garganica. It was, I think that's probably the, the was the most prominent white varietal in that area at that time. So I thought it'd be a great tie into this painting that most likely these people having a great time are drinking uh, the same wine, the same varietal that we're trying today. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Kind of, kind of. And I love that. That's like a new twist or new insight into this work, you know, that I wouldn't have thought about. Uh, and I love this work. That, that yeah. uh, scene, uh, I think I was telling you the other day, that scene of the gentleman on the far right, who's the, yeah. only, the only man in the, in the painting, um, that is a picture that I've seen in the wine world my whole career. The guy with the hat and the mustache and the glass. That's a very, uh, 
um, recognizable image to me from the wine uh, world. So yeah, I, maybe maybe singer sergeant needs to get some credit there. I don't know. I probably should. <laughs> <laughs> but I love. I thought this was such a great, uh, you know, very general painting to say this ties into the region and most likely the same wine that we're trying today. Yeah. Yeah, and I think with um, with Sargent, you know, he he was um, born in Florence, actually, to American parents, and frequently went back to uh, Venice and the Veneto region um, during the summers, um, you know, from about 1898 to 1913. Um, so this is kind of right in the middle of kind of his his love of of being in this area. Um, it is an oil painting, but when he was there in, in that region, in Venice, he would stick mostly to watercolor, so it's pretty rare to have an oil uh, mm -hmm. by him um, from his time there. And this is actually sort of a, a composite, um, composite kind of uh, painting. So the four women, the four brunette women, are actually the same model. So he's sort of, you know, artistic license here, creating, creating a scene for us based on his own experiences of what he would have would have gone to or or seen um, walking around in Venice. And it's got a very sketch like quality to that. And that is because, you know, he was he was working in a kind of an impressionist style here. So thinking about I don't know what you were saying about the winemaker, Harry Mathilde, you know, what were you calling that again when you when you take the whole grapes Oh, the whole cluster. The yeah, whole, whole cluster. cluster. I feel like that's what Sargent is doing. He's taking the whole cluster of paint and just working right. it. You know, I mean, just like working, you can see the kind of the really the movement of the brush stroke and the painterly quality here. You can see the slashes. And then when he kind of gets to the, that's their bodies and then really focuses more on the face, especially with the woman kind of with her face towards us and turn slightly on the right. Yeah. Um, the other thing to, for this painting that's, that's of note in the back, uh, ground of the painting, you see the woman sort of with the fair hair. And that's actually been identified of, as um, a woman, Jane de Glenn. And she was a, a, also an artist and a friend of Whistler, excuse me, Sargent, and um, would travel with her and her husband traveled with them. Um, and so she shows up in a lot of work um, by him. And actually, I'm just going to share a, a, a portrait of Sargent from 1903. So this was a, a year after the painting was painted. I always like to, to see what the artist is like, much like seeing the, the, uh, the winemaker, what they look like is, is really cool. Um, this is another work from the collection called the Rialto um, that's on view now, a little bit later. And the blonde woman in the gondola is the same woman, is, is Jane again, this woman. Um, so she shows up a lot in, in his work. Um, and I love this, this painting, the Rialto, you know, normally the Rialto bridge, big landmark in Venice, but, but painters are going to paint the actual bridge, but, you know, Sargent is interested in the underside of the bridge and, and from a view of a gondola. And that's how he would really roam around and, and sketch and paint was from a gondola. So you're really like in the middle, you feel like, right, you're in in this gondola with him. Like, like you feel like you're in this wine shop. You're in, you've just walked in and are gonna sit down and you can hear them talking. I love to imagine what these people are talking about, you know, um, over, over a glass of wine. Well, bo both of the paintings have very warm colors. They have a very warm feel to them. Yep. Um, yep. Even the one outside, I think as I said, the colors look, are, are, are wonderful. Um, oh, we've got a good question, um, Harry. Um, the bottle in the picture looks like a Chianti. Yes, I saw the one on the left there, like the fiasco or the flask. Yeah, and she um, she's asking, do the bottle shapes and colors affect the product? Um, I'm not sure that the shapes affect so much as maybe the color. And I think the color would only be because if it was sitting somewhere that was well lit with sunlight and things, it could be affected by that. So a darker bottle might be a little bit more protective. Um, but I don't really know that uh, the shape has a lot to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to move forward and um, it is getting close to our official yeah, end time sorry. and again as we're thinking i know we just it gets so caught up but these are really great questions please feel free to stay you know if you have something else to do no offense if you have to log off we're we're um recording this so um we will um post it to youtube at a later, later date if you do need to go um so let's let's go over to our next uh selection you have for us harry um this this red so the red we're going to do today is from a producer named Alessandro Veglio. Alessandro Veglio is uh, 38 years old. 
He is um, he was born in the village of Lamora, which is in the Piedmont, so that northwest part of Italy. So you see on the map there the area that says Piedmont, uh, <clears throat> which is a general for that whole area. Lamora is going to be a little bit further south than the dot of Piedmont. Uh, Alessandro is a first generation winery winemaker. Uh, his parents grew grapes, but they sold them off, never made them. Um, and so he's 38 years old, 38 years old now, but um, in 2005, he went to the Alba School of Enology and, and learned how to make wines, worked at a bunch of friends' cellars, and then he started making small amounts of wine in a friend's cellar for a few years, 05, 06, 07. In 2008, he started his own winery. Um, and I know that, uh, so what we're going to do is the Dolcetto. So uh, the piece of art that Celeste will be talking about is called the Barolo Chapel. So Barolo is kind of the, that's kind of the king area in town of the Piedmont uh, region. And Alessandro uh, makes wonderful Barolos. Uh, but for our tasting today, we decided just mainly from a cost standpoint to go with something that was a little bit more affordable. Um, the Barolos uh, from almost any producer would be more in the 40, 50, 60, 70 dollar range and up. And I thought that would be a little kind of silly to do for a tasting today like this. So we're doing his Dolcetto. Um, Dolcetto is a very interesting grape. I think a lot of people, when they hear the word Dolcetto, they think it might be something that's sweet. And there's definitely nothing sweet about Dolcetto. I think it is a little bit lighter, a little more delicate, a little more fruit forward than the Nebbiolo based grapes of, uh, of Barolo. Um, but I think that it's a, uh, the, uh, the other thing that's neat about it is I do know that most of the winemakers in uh, the Piedmont area, Dolcetto is their everyday wine. That's what they drink when they get out of, when they finish working in the, in the winery or in the vineyards, they all drink Dol Dolcetto. It's not a light wine. I think it's a, it definitely has some, um, some oomph to it. Uh, so this is uh, all from a, a little town. Originally his vineyards for his Dolcetto was in Lamora, but then he moved it to a little town called Rodino, which was about 10 miles away from Lamora, which, he's, which Alessandro seems to think is the best area to grow Dolcetto. It's a higher elevation, 1700 feet versus 600 feet uh, for Matilda's wine over in the Veneto. Um, and I know on the picture that I think we might have, maybe after Alessandro here. This one, Perry. Uh, the next one with the, I'm sorry, with the picture of the grapes. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, it's the chapel picture with the background. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know if we want to go there yet. Okay, well. Yeah, we can. Okay, so there you see the background. That, that is uh, the town up on the hill directly behind that to the upper right. That is probably the, the town of Barola up on the hill there. Uh, but this, but the Barola Chapel is down on the, on the lower elevation there. Um, but he, uh, Alessandro, uh, planted his Dolcetto grapes uh, in this town uh, called Rodino. Again, he thinks the best area for it, cooler soil, higher elevation. Um, and it makes it possible there for him to make wines that are not overly complex, a little bit easier to drink, sometimes lower alcohol, although on his, he's 13%. So I don't know if I really call that low, but it's definitely not a high alcohol red wine. Um, but it makes wines a little bit fresher, fruitier. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and give this a taste, and if you guys have a uh, Dolcetto in front of you or some other delicious red wine, uh, give it a try. Dolcetto, again, is a bridal. I think to be a little bit more, more on that kind of lighter to medium-bodied style. It has a lot of acidity. It makes my mouth water. That is actually what makes it such a great food wine. Um, Free Run is a company we deal with a lot of restaurants, so a lot, I think a lot of the wines that we represent tend to be higher in acid, than a lot of wines that a lot of people are used to drinking. But I think the secret to that is wines with acid are the best complement to foods. You know, if you have like a big, I like to use this analogy and it's kind of disparaging to something, but uh, California Chardonnay, like a California Chardonnay with a crab cake is like a traditional match you see in a lot of restaurants. But honestly, it's probably one of the worst matches I think to put together because that rich buttery oakiness you're getting from a California Chardonnay is gonna completely overpower the delicate sweet flavors of crab meat. So I kind of think that a wine that has a little bit more acidity and lightness works better with foods, like the Dolcetto here. Uh, I think this would be great with any kind of roasted meats, a charcuterie platter, uh, anything would be good like that. The picture uh, Celeste has up now is of uh, Alessandro and his uncle Mauro. Uh, Mauro Veglio has had a winery for years now and is a very well-respected and well-known uh, producer in the Piedmont region. Alessandro's first generation, he's kind of new here. Mauro has no, he had no heirs, no children, so he is, uh, in the last couple of years, he and, Be and uh, Alessandro have, are working together. I think that Alessandro now is making the wines for Morrow's Winery. Um, they're probably sharing some grapes. Uh, I think they'll always keep them as separate labels, but um, it, it's a cool thing to have generational uh, works here. You have the, the, the nephew, 
the uncle, land has been the family for years, generations, and making wines that are just delicious from those from those regions. So, um, Dolcetto de Alba, Alba is the the village in the Piedmont area uh, where he is. Um, very clean, light. This is all done in tank. There's no oak on this, so this is not a big, heavy, oaky red. It's a very clean, light, easy drinking red that I think is good on its own, or would be wonderful to have, like I said, with charcuterie, hard cheeses, uh, steak, burger. I mean, anything I think a uh, beef related would work well with this. So if anyone is tasting this now and wants to, again, share what they're kind of any flavors they're, they're sensing, and if not, that's okay. I'm not going to pressure uh, you. I'm just getting to the message. I'm seeing the message from uh, one of the panelists asking about uh, who's the guy. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I just told him he was right. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, that's exactly who that is. Um, there's a, actually, this is cool. There's a restaurant in the town of uh, Lamora called, uh, I think it's Moria Miche. And so many of the winemakers hang out in that place. And um, I think it's, 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 it's kind of interesting because uh, food and wine are such a, a part of life in Italy that I think uh, we should probably do more of here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Um, you want to talk about the chapel? Yeah, here's the grape. So that's what the grape yeah. looks like. Here. So Dolce, again, it's a, a big cluster of grapes, tight cluster. I don't know if you noticed, but on the, the, the white variety, I don't know if it was quite as tight as that. When you have tight clusters like that, one of the problems you have with that is that you can have mold and mildew and rot uh, can grow easier. So a looser cluster is usually good. Um, but he is, uh, again, higher elevation, cooler climate, airflow. So I think that that's, uh, that's, that's pretty important for these clusters of grapes. And thinking about that, that climate, so this is the Barolo Chapel. Um, this is on the Toretto uh, family vineyard. And so they make wine, obviously, as well. Um, and like Harry said, it's kind of that higher elevation. And this chapel um, is the exterior um, is painted by Saul Lewitt. So you see a picture of Saul uh, Lewitt there. Um, and the interior was done by Dr David Tremlett, who is a, a Swiss American, uh, excuse me, Swiss English um, artist. And how this sort of came about is the Toretto family bought the vineyard. Um, and this was actually a, I don't wanna say deconsecrated deconse church, but never a consecrated church, if that makes sense. Um, so it was um, um, a dilapidated sort of um, uh, in ruins when they bought it, um, built in 1914. No way. Um, your pizza. And um, we're going to inspect the pizza plates. Um, and. They wanted to really bring it to life, so they invited um, David Tremblett to do the interior, and Tremblett knew Solowit. Solowit had moved to um, Italy for about a decade, between like 1970s and 80s, and kept going back and visiting and hanging out in Italy, so he invited um, Lewitt to do the exterior. Um, so this was in 1998, it was renovated, 1999 it was finished, and if you can just imagine and you see it here, like the contrast here in terms of color. Um, it's really bright, um, ornately decorated or geometric decorated um, chapel plunked in the middle of these kind of green rolling hills. Um, so it looks a little incongruous, but actually Lilith, um, if you look at the side of the chapel, has sort of this undulation pattern and that's in direct response to the undulating hills in the background. So he is actually getting inspiration from the landscape in, in terms of shape but just shoots like a jolt of, uh, a jolt of color there. Um, it did, um, ha, yeah. So it did, uh, didn't go over well, um, I would say with the locals, um, but now it's really seen as a big attraction uh, for the area and called the Barolo Chapel, like Carrie said, because of the wine uh, produced, produced there. And actually here's an interesting tidbit, I hadn't told Harry this, um, they, I mean, obviously we paid them, but also part of their payment is both Lewitt and Triblet got a case of wine from, from the uh, vineyard uh, once a year for the rest of their lives. Um, so Lewitt passed away in 2007, um, Triblet is still, still with us. So um, that's, a, that's a pretty nice payment. So thinking about Lewitt, you know, um, we have a lot of work by Lewitt. Um, 
here's another view of the chapel just from the front in the winter time. So again, if you can imagine the contrast, you know, in the, in the spring and summer in the green, but in white, what that might look like uh, is pretty striking. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is wall drawing uh, 541. This is, um, was conceived in 1987, installed twice actually in the museum in 2000 and in 2009. Um, so Lewitt, um, and you can see the color scheme is very similar. So, you know, to, to the chapel, we see the same kind of green and yellow um, and pinks um, and the same, same kind of geometric quality here. Um, and with this, you know, he's the founder, really considered the founder of conceptual art. So he really believed, and this is a great quote from him, the idea becomes the machine for making art. So it's all about the idea or the concept of the work rather than necessarily the finished product. So when we acquired this work, it was actually acquiring the plans for the work, not the actual piece. Um, he likened it, and, and this is a great analogy, and when you're explaining conceptual art, it's, it's like, um, you know, Beethoven composed uh, a score or a, or a sonata, let's say, but that sonata can be played over and over again by a variety of musicians. It doesn't necessarily, and it can't be played by him. Um, or an architect designs a building, but he's not necessarily, he or she is not necessarily the one creating on the ground that, that building or that structure. And Solowit thought of, thought of his work the same way, so much so that actually a team of assistants, and in this case, BCU students, followed the directions for the work of art. And so you could have this work of art shown in the museum and another museum at the, simultaneously, you know, because it's, it's all about the idea, right? And it was installed twice because in 2000, we actually had to remove it because the wooden floor you see there had to be completely replaced in those galleries. So it was destroyed, but was it? You know, so, because if you think about like the idea wasn't destroyed, Merely the product of the or the outcome of the idea had to be removed. And then in 2009, two years after Lewitt's death, it was back again. So what you see now in the museum is actually the second iteration of wall drawing uh, 541. Um, and this is just a detail of that. And then just paired with, um, just to show you a little bit of variety of what Lewitt was, was doing, this is Splotch 22. This used to be in the atrium. Um, this is one of the last works that he did. Um, and again, much like the wall dra drawing, this started as sort of the footprint of this piece was his design. And then it was executed via computer and kind of, kind of built out from there um, and then fabricated in fiberglass with vinyl and paint. Um, and this is 12 feet tall. So this is the largest um, splash sculpture that we that he did. We, we lovingly refer to it as like the melting crown because that's what it reminds a lot of people of. Um, and then I just pair it, you know, much like Alessandro is, you know, generation and kind of working with his uncle and pairing grapes and learning from him and then creating his own. Wanted to um, bring um, Odilio Dita into the discussion and this really exciting new commission work that's going up right now in the atrium of the museum. So if you haven't been to the museum, um, you can see this work being installed uh, right now, Monday through Friday, um, um, right through the 22nd. So next week is the last week that it'll be worked on. This is the conceptual work uh, image of what it will look like. So right now they're scaffolding in front of it. Um, but you can really see it coming together. And Odilio Dita um, is a Nigerian born, um, uh, raised in the American Midwest, um, abstract expressionist. And for this piece, he was influenced by the Lewitt mural um, that we just looked at. So it's really about kind of that generational uh, pull. And his process is very similar to Lewitt in that he has a team of assistants. He draws up a plan. Um, and he has them execute it. But what's different about Odili's approach is he really sees color as representational um, and like um, a vehicle for conveying emotions. And when you're looking at his work, he wants you to be transformed. And so there's a lot of meaning behind it. This is called procession. And he was really influenced by the social political movement that's going on right now, the marches, the moving forward, the, the hope of change. And that's what he's really trying to convey 
with this work and his color choices. So you see that sort of that influence of the past uh, meeting with with a current generation and how he's taking that to the next level. And I like to think about that the same kind of with Alessandro and how he's working with his uncle and moving those things forward. It's a great correlation. I love this. I love this piece. I mean, and and again, he he also um, just kind of becoming more familiar with Adidas work. Um, he did say that, you know, for him, color for him is just, it may look simple, kind of these shades, but as you look closer and closer, there's more depth, you know, and he, he, he understands that for a lot of people, color can have different meaning or different emotions, and that he really hopes that people delve into that complexity. And it's the same for him as when you meet a person, you know, the the more you go and the more you deeper you get, there's a complexity that reveals itself. Again, I feel the same with like wine. When you're talking about wine or drinking that, that's like that experience that it continues to un unfold, you know, unfold and and um, get a little bit deeper. So very personal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very personal. I'll say that wine, and I, I, I hadn't said it, and I'll be quick with it. But I know that um, I say all the time that you know when someone tries a wine, if you taste a flavor that I don't taste. You're right. Don't worry if you don't taste the flavor I taste. We are all physiologically different. I think that we all perceive flavors and aromas differently. You smoke cigarettes, drink coffee, whatever it is, whatever it is, I think that um, we all perceive flavors differently. And I think that wine is probably the best beverage to try to discern differences. I don't think people try Coca-Cola and figure out what the differences are in it. But I do think with wine, so many people have different ideas of what they're tasting. And I think it comes from how we are physiologically put together. Um, you taste flavors more than other people. You have better aroma uh, sense than other people. So I always try to remember that with, with wine. You know, if you smell something that I don't say I'm smelling, don't think you're wrong. You're exactly right. Because I think that what you smell and taste is what you're smelling and tasting. Yeah. And, and I say the same thing, you know, when I'm, when I'm talking about art or just conversing with someone about art, you know, everyone's going to bring their own experience to that, that work or, it will evoke a memory for you that is going to be different from me, or you may uncover something by looking deeper that I haven't seen yet. Um, and it doesn't mean that that's wrong. Um, and I, I, or, you know, I, I can say, yes, this was painted by John Singer Sargent. Like Harry can say, yes, this is a Dolcetta grape, you know, that's true, you know, but all of that nuance around it, you know, that's, that's all up to that, that person coming to that experience. So it's very similar. Just like art, yep. Just like art, yeah. Like yeah. Oh, we have a hand raised. Hmm. I don't know how to do that. Do <laughs> Let me see here. And another one. If you have a question, if you could actually type it into the chat, that would be great. I don't know. Oh, and another hand. They didn't cover this in Zoom school. <laughs> Oh, Peter's chiming in. Did you see Peter? Tutti gusti, sang gusti. <laughs> of course. Every taste is a matter of taste. So true. It is very true. One person's, piece, one person's favorite piece of art is another person's like, oh my gosh, what is that? Yeah. And it's the same exact thing in wine. Somebody can say, this is the best one I've had in my life. And the person next to him wants to spit it out. They're both right. Yes. I think you remember about wine. I think people are so intimidated by wine and it really is such a personal flavor and taste that you perceive. And I think that uh, you're going to be right with what you taste, so. So again, I, if, you, if you have a question, you can pop it into the chat box. We'll take a few more, because I do want to be, it is 6.15, so we've gone way over. I think for next time, we'll just make it an hour. <laughs> what well, do you least, think, Harry? I agree, at least 45. Yeah. So if, if there aren't any more questions, I mean, I hope you, you know, enjoyed um, the selections. Um, one thing to say, I know these wines will be featured by the glass uh, yeah. interviews. They're going to be uh, featured by the glass up in the restaurant upstairs, um, I guess starting maybe this weekend or next week or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know that the chef is really excited to suggest pairings, food pairings, like Harry was saying before, uh, for each of these. Um, yeah, everyone's saying make it an hour for sure. Thank you. Yes, we will. 
And um, where can I purchase the bottles of these? So they are available through VMFA to go um, and Amuse, and you know, available. To, it's, I think the red might be a little more difficult to get a hold of, Harry. At the museum, uh, you guys bought pretty much all of the uh, dolcetto that was left um, before we switched to another vintage. Um, and, and we're on the uh, eight, oh, 18 vintage now. So, um, but I do, uh, I know at Jay Emerson's, the wine shop over at Libyan Grove, um, I know they've been big supporters of Matilda Poggi's wines. So they should probably have, uh, or if they don't have it, they could have it uh, very quickly, some of the uh, uh, Garganica. Um, but the Dolcetto, unfortunately, the museum, uh, not unfortunately, but the museum. No, it's is, a great thing. It's a wonderful Come thing. Come on. <laughs> yeah. um, and um, I know we're going to do this again and probably find some other regions uh, and different things to try, which I think has been fun. And um, I hope you guys have enjoyed this. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Again, first time I've done a webinar. Uh, known Celeste a long time, and I'm, I'm excited that she uh, contacted me about doing this and thank her and the museum and Chase. Chase is sponsor for this. Uh, yes, thank this you. Um, and I will say for... Um, Oh, someone did ask. Oh, someone said, let's do bubbles next time. Okay. Okay. Um, that's a good suggestion. And um, someone asked, oh, someone from the Lynchburg area was wondering where they could purchase the wines. I don't know, Harry, if you... Lynchburg. Um, I honestly don't know. I'd have to check with, I mean, I actually kind of handle Richmond. I know we have a rep that does Lynchburg Lexington area, but I don't know where they have these wines for sale. Um, I know we deal with... Uh, in any of the independent wine shops that are in those towns, if you go in them, most likely they deal with our company free run and you could make a request and we could, you know, we deliver pretty much right. every day. So they okay. could uh, get it quicker if need be. Thank you. Um, and suggest some wines to purchase at the museum. Yes. So the two that we tasted are available through VMFA to go. And other wines, you also, does the museum also offer their other wines on their list yeah. to go? Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. they have a whole wine list of things that you can choose and pick from. Yeah. And Amuse is open, so, you know, and observing social distance and everything. So if, if you're interested in trying it by the glass as opposed to getting the whole bottle, again, that special will be on um, and available. So next Taste of Art is going to be um, October 9th. So um, you will get a survey from today and I, we would love if you could fill that out. And in that survey, there is a question about what you would be interested in, in doing next time um, by region. And there's also a space to fill in, you know, other, if you don't see a selection that you, that you like. And, you know, we um, would love to hear from you about that because we haven't settled on one yet um, on, on, on a topic for the ninth. So it'd be really great to just hear from you all on what you would be interested in doing. And um, I'm, you know, someone's asking about the wines in Best Cafe. These wines would not be by the glass in Best Cafe. Um, they have a whole other set of wines there that are also very good and by the glass and probably also available for retail sale. But the two wines we're doing today would be more up in the uh, in the museum. Yeah. yeah. Um, I will also say if you are um, interested in beer, you know, um, as well or, or instead, um, on the fourth Fridays we focus. We're going to be focusing on beer tastings, and that will be from the cafe. Um, so that virtual, um, but those selections would be available in the cafe. So um, that will be um, at the, the fourth Friday in October. Um, and that date right now is just kind of going out of my mind. But if you have a calendar, check that out. And all of the, these listings will be um, on the website on the Fridays after five presented by Chase page. Um, so do, do fill out that survey. So um, with that, I want to thank Harry so much for, for joining us and making these selections and walking us through those tastings. It's really great. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it. I mean, I'm sitting, I mean, when you and I started the Art of Wine thing back years ago, I thought that was the, one of the coolest events in Richmond for wine. I mean, it wasn't a normal tasting in a store. It wasn't a normal tasting or a wine dinner in a restaurant. It was art and wine. And, yeah. uh, they, they were so well attended, and I think that this is the start of, a, of getting that up again. And I love the digital format's a, a fun way to do it. So, yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, thank thanks, thanks so much. I hope everyone has a great evening and a great weekend. Thank you again for joining us. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Have a great weekend.